You don't go to a whole lot of churches where the preacher sits on a bar stool and preaches, but there you are. Huh? That's just, it. that's, you get what you get, okay? So, isn't it good to be in God's house? Oh, man. It's good having my kids with me. All of them, all four of them here in front of me. Jody, good to have you and Matt here. Matt, we're praying for you. We're glad you're here with us so that you can be among friends that love you dearly. All right, we've been talking about the different things that the... the here we go again. It's my time. I'd like to know where to put this on. I don't know where to put it. No, I don't think it's touching anything. I think it's just this connection. Anyway, just ignore that if you can. I'll try to get it where it won't move. Anyway, we, uh, we, uh, we, it's good. We've been talking about the, the, the different things that we are affected by, by the resurrection. Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is paramount to the faith of a Christian. The Bible even says in 1 Corinthians 15, if it were not for the resurrection of Christ, we would be of all men most miserable. We would be absolutely without hope if it were not for the resurrection. But it doesn't stop at the resurrection because he instructed us to continue to focus our minds on the resurrection. And so as we, as we study together, we've been on this for several Sundays, but the, the way it transforms people is vital to the understanding of how us Christians should be affected by the fact of the resurrection. So many churches today are wanting to try to um, make the resurrection of less, uh, uh, a less importance, if you will, a less focus on that because they feel like, well, that, that, that's kind of way out there Christianity. Well, I guess we're way out there Christians because uh, the truth of the resurrection is vital. The understanding of what happened when he was resurrected from the grave, we've already looked at. But just to remind you, the, th the thing is, is it, Jesus Christ, according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, Jesus was shown to be fully God at the resurrection. The Bible records that the Holy Spirit was the power behind the resurrection. It also records that God the Father was the power behind the resurrection. And Jesus told us in John chapter 10 that it was by his power that he raised himself from the grave. So how do you do with that? How do you, how do you put them all together? It's not a contradiction. Jesus Christ is God. There is one God, one Lord, one Savior. And so we, we look at the Trinity with our frail minds. We can't understand how three can be one. We can't even describe how three can be one. But three are one, and God was on that cross. That means that God died for your sins. That means that God was buried, and Satan gleefully thought he had won. He had finally killed God. And uh, then the stone moved, as we, as we say in that time. And, you know, and right up until then, it was all wonderful for Satan, and then the stone rolled back. And it was proven that he had already risen. And so we are still worshiping God for that. But how should the transformation of Jesus Christ uh, in Peter's life affect you? It should affect you in our understanding that you are where Peter was. When, when, when the resurrection happened, just think about this. The context of the sermon today is, is, that, is, is that, the, that Peter, here he is fishing. He had gone back to his normal employment. He had, in a sense, they had lost hope. But then whenever the resurrection happened, they're all kind of confused. What happened? And Peter does what Peter would do naturally. What Matt would probably do. Goes fishing. Goes hunting. Go some, doing something that he was, that's what his business was, and fine, then let's go on. And Jesus is on the seashore cooking fish. He says, bring me some fish and I'll, we'll, let's eat. Well, this is the risen Lord. How can the risen Lord be able to 
eat well that tells me one thing about our bodies too when we when we are perfected when we get to go to heaven evidently the body we have will be like Jesus's body I'm going to enjoy fish I'm going to enjoy some of these things okay here's the thing though that after his failure at the campfire Peter is in need of restoration you know we all are prone to try to fit in. And when Peter was around that fire, he was trying to fit in with those that were actually there to see the, the, the death of Jesus Christ. And his failure was he, denied, he was pressured into denying his faith three times. And Jesus had warned him and he told him, when you hear that, You'll be. You'll know. Let's look at. Let's look at John twenty one fourteen through seventeen, and I, and and you read it out of your own Bible if it, if you if you need to, but it's. But I just like the way that this puts it. He says, and this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. This is the third time they had seen him. Okay, after G, after breakfast, Jesus asks Peter, Simon. Son of Jonah, sign of this is a John, but you know the word Jonah and John and Jonas and all the different uses are just they're all the same. Okay, so they they chose to use the word John. Okay, oh, I don't care. Do you love me more than these? In other words, he's sitting there at the fire and all of these other guys are there. He says, uh, "Yes, Lord, you know that I love you." He says, "Then feed my lambs." In other words, he repeated the question to him again, John, Simon. Son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, he asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Why was Peter hurt? Why, what, what, we're going to study this out. But why was Peter hurt at that question? And he said the question a third time, and he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. The word love in the Greek literature shows up in four different methods, four different words. Uh, the first one doesn't show up in the Bible, but we'll read the description of it anyway. And that is a Greek word, eros. And it's where we get the word erotic or eroticism or whatever comes out of that word. And you can imagine what kind of love that is. It's a, it's a, it's a carnal love. It's a love primarily with, that is felt within the body. It is excitement, elation, joy. The elevated buzz of erotic love is said to be natural. It naturally fades within a year of its beginning, perhaps because it's too exhausting and consuming. So, you know, maybe you just maybe we're just lazy. So I, I, I dedicate this one. I, I call this one the lazy love. So one that whew, how you feel it within your body and it's all wonderful and then it just pff, goes away. Okay. There's no commitment to it, all right? That's not even mentioned in Scripture. Okay, that word isn't. Phileo is the next one that we talk about. You get the word Philadelphia. What was Philadelphia? What, what, what was the reason for Philadelphia's name? Brotherly. brotherly love. It describes, this is the word phileo, brotherly love. It is a love, it, if, if eros is the love of the, within the body, then this one is a love within the soul, okay? It's a love, it's easy it's an easy love. It's an affection. It's a, it, you want to put the word like to it? That's more like, it's more like I like you, okay? And it's a, it, you know, it, 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 the friendship toward other people that you feel, the same interests, you know, social grace is the style that they have. The word conveys love, but it's not necessarily within anything to do with commitment, Okay. Then we have storge, and storge is not in this passage, so you want to basically, you want to just understand what it is, and storge is the, is the word for community and family, the love of community, family, uh, the love of, of, of things that are your uh, fellowship together. That's, a, that's, that's storge, and it's more of a, a pleasure in the thing it, that it, above all things, be will, uh, uh, unwilling to abandon or uh, no, I got off on, on it. It's the, it's the it's the love that is a carnal love, but it's powerful enough to hinder our spiritual growth if pressure comes from within the people you hang out with. 
Storge is a love that you feel a little bit of commitment with it and they can kind of pull you away from the Lord. Uh, that, that, that is, that is a, that's the word storge. Now then, the, third, the, the fourth one is the most important though, agape. And we talked about it before in here, but let me put it to this point. This is a more sacrificial love, okay? It is a mature parental type love. It is, an agape love is the love I have for my family here. I would do something if you tried to attack them. Okay, that's, that's agape. Okay, agape is a love that is willing to sacrifice to hold what is there. It is, a, it is um, you, you know, the, the Thayer lexicon said agape beautifully. It describes it when it says it, it, to take pleasure in a thing, to prize it above all things, to be unwilling to abandon it, or to do without it. Agape loves usually cost the bearer. Agape puts the beloved first and the sacrifices and pride of self-interest and the possessions for the sake of that beloved. We're willing to just we're spend it all for that person. This is the love that God has for us. It is the love whenever we say that God is love, it is agape. God is agape love. And, and so w- the lesson in, the, in today's sermon is to understand where your commitment level is within these words that are going to be played on upon this in, in this questionnaire session that, that Jesus has with Peter. There's something important found in that. And so, you know, the, the love that caused Jesus Christ to sacrifice himself on the cross for our sins and be able to to know that we are loved by a God who loves us willingly that God himself would remove himself from the position of high uh, kingship and come down and allow himself to be born as a human, live his life as a human, and die as a human for one reason, so that you could know Jesus Christ, the i.e. God, perfectly. We can see how he acted and know that that's who God is. We can follow his movements and follow what he thinks and what he feels. And we know that God, see, God, had, God is a spirit and therefore man does not be, is not able to be in his presence. He's too powerful. So he, commi- he, he puts a, the, the Bible calls it a logos in, in John chapter one. For, he, he says uh, that that is the very illustration of God is who Jesus was. All right, so all of that is a background. Let's get into the study on this and let's look at it. Okay, so when he asks, lovest thou me, what is he really truly saying? So we're going to see the difference in this in this because most, I don't know of any Bible that gets this right in the way that they write it, okay? It, they don't follow the Greek meanings for the word love. All of them, including the King James, put the word love or charity in the in in the description of 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 first first Corinthians thirteen. The word love or the word charity means something a love that costs you something. But not even the King James puts it correctly in the way that it reads when you when you take a lexicon, as I was showing my granddaughter to do the other day, to sit down with a Strong's concordance and look at a verse and look the words up and then write them in her own fashion so that she could see what that what that verse meant to her. And it, and, and 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 I'm proud of the fact that we got to sit down and do that. But here's the thing. If you're not into looking at what these words mean, you will miss this. Let me just bring it up. Uh, you know, what is agape love? I told you about 1 Corinthians 13. Somebody can help me out with it. Let's jump down to the middle of the verse, Becky, and say, uh, okay, there it is. Love is patient and kind. This is agape love. Now, in the King James, it says charity. It's the same word. It's just the meaning of love that costs. Is, the word, is what charity is. So it says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It, let this sink in. This is who God wants us to be. It, it does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. 
It keeps no record of being wronged. Throw your tally book away. You're not supposed to be keeping a tally on other people, okay? That's not even, God doesn't even do that. Why would you be above God? When somebody does something wrong, you know what we're supposed to do? Forgive, right? Everybody knows this. We're supposed to forgive. You know what the word forgive means? It means to put it around behind your back and bury it and don't go back there. Somebody once said, Jesus puts it in the sea behind him and then puts up a sign that says no fishing. I like that. You're not supposed to go looking for it to use it over somebody. Okay, go on. Different sermon. Okay, but he says it does not rejoice in injustice. It, it does not rejoice whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Boy, can marriages today all over learn this. Yes, there's a time whenever I understand divorce has to happen. But this right here would stop a commitment between a man and a woman. It would stop the breakup of it if they truly understood these verses. Once you're committed to it, you're committed to it. Like I said, I realize whenever many of you have been divorced and I realize what, I'm not saying everybody has to stay married forever and put up with everything that goes on. I'm saying this is the way it ought to be, all right? Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and the speaking of in unknown languages and special knowledge will all become useless, but love will last Forever. Agape love is indelible. It's written on your heart by God himself and it never loses or fades away. Somebody say amen, please. Amen. This, is what, this is what it's all about, folks. Now, let's get back to Peter here. What did, what did he do to Peter? Well, you, you think Jesus warned Peter to be careful and to stay into prayer because Satan had come to him seeking to test Peter. He had to come to Jesus for permission, amen? He could not do it himself. He had to come. That means that when you are attacked in this manner by Satan, you have been approved by God that you're going to get through it. You're going to be approved by God that he'll stand up to it. Not all of us do. Look at Peter. We're going to look at it. Jesus had told him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. I like that word demanded. Look it up in, the, in your Strong's Concordance. He demanded of God to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus was praying for Peter. Get that. God praying for strength to go through what Peter needed to go through. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, we know the story, don't we? Peter finds himself in a desperate... I don't know what that thing's listening to. It's not me. But, it, but Peter finds himself among enemies. He's desperate and in need of strength. He needs God's help and he's failing and God is, is being tried. Jesus is being tried in the other room. And in John chapter 18, verse 25 through 27 says, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself when they said to him, You also are not one of these disciples, are you? He denied and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had just cut off, asked, Did you not see him in the garden with, see you in the garden with him? And Peter, again, denied it. There was a third denial, if we read all of the scriptures, and then the rooster crowed. What, what was the pur purpose of the rooster crowing? Jesus had told him, you'll see this happen when the third time you deny me, that rooster's going to crow. And that rooster crowed. Can you imagine how heartsick Peter was in hearing that rooster and realizing what he had just done. Now, this is the background story about what is happening over again as, as this. You know, look in there. Peter denies him three times. He is, you know, the crucified, risen, and, and, and you know, crucified, buried, and risen Jesus 
was now on the seaside with them and amongst them, talking with them and eating with them and fellowshipping with them. And Peter once again finds himself at a fire, warming himself around a different crowd this time. And Jesus turns to him in the middle of it and says, and let's go ahead and study this. You know, what, did, what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to go out and win the world for Christ. They were supposed to go out. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go you therefore to preach, all, preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's what they were supposed to do. What are they doing? Well, sadly enough, they're not. They're hiding and they're fishing. Okay. Well, okay, I can get it. You've got to have food to eat. Jesus understood that as much. But what he did is he turned his attention on Peter. And he says something interesting to him. Follow it. The, see the red words that are there? Follow the way the words are. Peter, do you love me? Is That's in your Bible, right? Okay, you can see that. Peter, do you love me? And the word is used is agape. Do you love me with a sacrificial, undeniable love? What had Peter just done? He says, he says, do you love me more than these around you? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you, do you love me without reservation? Would you die for me, Peter? Peter had kind of boldly said before, he said, God, if, if, no matter what happens, we'll go to death for you if they have to. What's he, what did he do when the pressure come on? He denied him. And I'm not cutting Peter down. I'm saying put yourself in that position and know that the pressure was on and he just couldn't stand up to it for whatever reason. But Peter answers him and says something, Lord, you know that I like you. Your, word, your Bible probably says love you, but it's the word phileo, not agape. Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me and he said you know I phileo you and what does Jesus do he says look I feel and Peter says I feel affection for you you're my friend I've hung around with you for the last three, three years three and a half years and Jesus says take care of my lambs Take care of the, the least of the flock of, of, that I'm going to give them into your care. Even though he had just said, I like you. Then, then, then he looks up at Peter again and he says a second time, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me? Do you love me more than this world? Do you love me more than anything that, you're, that you love in your life? And Peter's answer is, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I give Peter one thing. He's honest. He hadn't come to the point of sacrificial because he just, a little girl just caused him to deny Christ. He's feeling pretty rotten right now. It's interesting. Peter feeling rotten about his sin did not stop God from confronting him with his sin. And he won't you either. That's just it. He's not going to overlook your sin because you're a good guy and go to church. He's going to confront you with your sin one-on-one -on -one and he's going to make demands of you to answer him. Do you love me with an, a sacrificial love? And Peter once again says, you know, you know that I am ashamed. I lack love for you the way you want me to. I'm not worthy of anything more than just being your friend. Shepherd my sheep. Supply their needs. Work in my fields. These fields that are white unto harvest. You, Peter, go out and work for me. He's just, he's not denying Christ here, but he just can't come up to the level that God wants him to come up to. So he asks him a third time, Peter, do you even like me? He challenges his commitment to even phileo level of love. No wonder Peter was crushed 
No wonder this hurt so bad that Jesus would say, not agape, but Jesus brought the love word down to phileo and says, do you even love me in a phileo type setting? And what does Peter say? He says, God, you know, he's crushed in spirit. And he says, you know that I only like you. You know that my level is at the level of phileo. He's unable to come up to that unconditional love level. His denial had just proved all of that. He, he is hurt inside. Guess what? When you're hurt inside by God bringing you to your sin, you're crushed in spirit. What does he want you to do? Admit it. And he just did. That is what confession is. Peter confessed to the Lord, Lord, you see me. You know that I'm not coming up to the level that I should have. I just failed you. I just denied you. My actions prove that I don't come up to that level. What does he say? Jesus answers him and says, take care of my sheep. In other words, I give you your ministry back. Why? Because Peter had admitted and, and confessed his sin openly before God. And that's what God wants of all of us. We are going to fail God. But what he wants when, he, when the Holy Spirit puts the pressure on you and you come to that point of being crushed in spirit that yes, I have sinned God. He just wants you to do what the word confession means. To agree with God. You agree as Peter agreed. And he says, I give you your ministry back. Peter was shown that even though he failed, God was no less full of mercy and grace. God is a God of mercy and grace whenever you fail. He's going to forgive you, but you've got to turn around. You've got to do what the word repentance means. And that means I'm going this direction and I know this is wrong. And God points a finger at it and I said, you're right, God, this is wrong. And you turn around and you go that way because that's the way God wants you to do. That's what repentance means. Confession, agreeing with God, turning around, putting your back on what you were and saying, I'm sorry. And guess what? My Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ is faithful to always forgive sin if we will just say it. Now, what does he do? Does he forgive sin and then bring it up later in your life? No, God puts it away completely. It's not there anymore. Whatever you've done that was a failure before God and you feel, felt crushed about it and you confessed it and you turned around, guess what? It's not there anymore. It's gone. The power of that is just incredible to me. Are we, you know, Psalm 103, 14 says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God knows who you are. It doesn't surprise him that you sin. Why do you think before the foundations of the world were ever created that God provided your salvation. We saw that on Resurrection Sunday. Before ever God had created the earth, you were on his mind. He knows your name. He knows who you are. And he provided the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't understand what eternity is like, but the Bible records that he had already died before the foundations of the world were ever there. How does that work? Because God is outside of time. When he chose to go to the cross was before the creation of the world. You were already paid for. He, God knew your name. God knew who you were. He knew what you would do in your life. He knew what Peter would do. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God knows who you are. He knows that what you, when you fail him, it doesn't give you an excuse, but he knows and he provided for you. And we all fall short of God's glory and we all have that pain of knowing that that was there. But whenever, listen to this and hear this, please, please, please listen to this. Whenever you, something brings up your sin that has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, the most impressive commodity on the earth, 
There's no other commodity that has ever been on the earth like the blood of Jesus. Do you realize that whenever you are in the position that it comes back up and confronts you, it is not God who is doing it. It is Satan who hates you and wants to crush your heart for no reason because that sin is no longer there. All you have to do is claim the blood of Christ. You feel that crushed feeling. You tell him, no, sir. No, sir, Mr. Satan. Guess what? You are nothing but a created being just like I am. Only Jesus Christ died for my sins, shed his blood, and I have claimed that sin cleansing blood for my own life. You have no right here. You have no purpose here. Be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. You understand you have that power because Jesus gave it to you. Don't let Satan eat you up for your guilt. So move on. What happens? We fall in love with God again. The rest of the story for Peter. Now, we've told all about his pain at the fireside that night, but the rest of the story, you got to get this. Peter and all the rest of them are gathered together at Pentecost <laughs> whenever Jesus has been ascended and gone back to heaven and said, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit of God. And they're sitting in the room, and guess what? The Bible records it was Peter that was there, and the tongues of, 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 of fire-like looking thing fell on them and consumed, ate them up on the inside, and they're just rejoicing and joyful because the power of the Holy Spirit had never been pouring out, poured out like that before. Peter is there and he is a recipient of that power. What is it? How does it react? Well, it's just this simple. Immediately in your scriptures, Peter brings the most powerful message I can imagine to the Jews and confronted them with their sin and said, you're the one that put him on the cross. The Jews who God loves dearly provided for the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and he said it was you that did it. Guess what the what happens through the power of the Holy Spirit? 3000 people. 3000 people. Acts 2:41. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day to them about 3000 souls. This is the same Peter that denied Jesus at the campfire. See what the difference is? Confession repentance, and the Holy Spirit's power. And he's back doing what Jesus said, feed my sheep. And he brings 3,000, he brings this message and the Holy Spirit saves 3,000 people. Have you ever been placed into a position where you are pressured and everybody else is kind of doing something you shouldn't do and, and that pressure comes on and you feel like going with them? You feel like, and you slip, and you do something that, that, at the very least, that does not stand for Christ. This is what we're talking about. That power is the same power that is there for you to be able to say, no, I'm not going to. Outside of the steps of this very church, I've told the church this before. Sitting in a car full of boys who were making plans to skip the hayride, which was a church function to go over here and, and go on a hayride down here by the Bacha Ranch where it is now, and go down there and have a, a campfire and, and sing, and, and all the older kids are getting ready to go, and I'm younger, and I was sitting out here with some boys and that were planning on us. Let's, let's don't do that. Let's, let's skip. And let's go get some beer and let's do this and do that. And, wanna, and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, I've never felt anything like that before, but it was like electricity going through my body. And it was trying to come out ever pore in my body. And I'm like, oh my word, what in the world's going on? I said, I cannot be here. And out the door of the car I went. I went to the hayride. You know what? You know what that means to me? I, I got to win. It means that much to me. 
The power of the Holy Spirit is the same power that can tell you to say, no, I will not do this, which Peter had too. But he didn't, but he was still accepted even though. But what more joy would have been in Peter's heart if he could have stood there and said, Lord, I have stood for you when everybody else was wanting to crucify me because I was with you. What more, how would that have changed the story? I don't know, but in God's power and God's forgiveness, just remember, Jesus is not only asking these questions of Peter, but for all of us. And he's saying to us, come on, come to me, admit it, turn around, and I'll give you a ministry. You say, oh, I'm not, I'm not preaching material. I can't. Listen, can I just have you look at me for a minute? Every one of you has a ministry, whether you like it or not. The only question is, are you willing to do it or not? You have a ministry. You say, well, I don't know what it is. So do what Elizabeth Elliot says, do the next thing. And as you take the next step and the next step, and, the, and God will guide you around whatever you're facing and you will do the next thing. And if you're working under the power of the Holy Spirit, it's his job to take you to the ministry he wants you to have. So let him just take the next step in front of you. What is it? I don't know. Let's just take a step and see what it, where it leads. Take a step and see where it leads. And look for the ministries that God's going to give you to share with others because your main purpose back at the first was to tell people about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's up to us. Don't stop at the level of phileo. Take yours, like he said, that we should love one another sacrificially. That we should love God sacrificially. 1 John chapter 4. What is God? God is agape love. God is love. And that's where he wants you. So your, the pressure here is not on Peter. The pressure is not on any one of us. It's on all of us this morning. And all you have to do is commit yourself to it. You understand the word believe and the word commit are the same word in the Greek. You commit yourself to it. And when you do, watch for the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill His purpose in your life. Amen. Let's all stand. I'm going to pray for you, but here's what I want. I want, if you feel God pressure in your heart right now, don't just stand and sing. You You've got a pew that you can kneel down on. You can sit back down on the pew. You can do whatever you need to do, but get one-on-one -on -one with God and you tell him what he needs to hear. God, I only love you in a phileo level and I want to go to the pier. Or you tell him, God, you see this sin in my life. I'm, conf I'm, I'm, I'm so drawn to this sin and, and I need you to forgive me. That's how, that's what he wants. Turn away from it. It's what he wants. All you have to do right now is do that. Well, we, we're going to sing, but you can sit down and you can have a one-on-one -on -one with God at your campfire. What a blessing. Amen? Amen. I'm going to sing. I hope you do too. But, you know, you deal with God where you need to. Okay? Father, I adore. Lay my life before you, how I love you. You mean it? Jesus, I agape you. Lay my life before you, sacrificially, Lord, I agape you. Spirit, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Heavenly Father, 
We stand before you as people who are just like Peter. There's no difference. As I put my outline out, I had a preacher write back to me on the, on the newsletter and say, me and, me and Peter are buds. <laughs> I, I know there's times when I need to be a higher level than I am and I just haven't come up. God, I confess that to you right now and I ask you to forgive me and I want to turn away from it. Give me the strength. Give me the faith. Give me the power to be able to do just that. And Father God, I ask you to bless these that are in front of us, that they would have that same conviction in their lives. Thank you, Father. And we say as one, we adore you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Go and be blessed by God. Amen? Amen. Amen.